Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome on this uh, webinar um, organized by Regident. Um, we have today, tonight, the big pleasure and honor to uh, welcome Professor Andrea Piloni. Um, we hope that uh, you're all um, safe and healthy in this uh, crazy period of uh, COVID. Um, it's a, it's a difficult situation and we have some thoughts for all the one of you that have uh, tough situations. Um, this presentation uh, is gonna last 60 minutes. Um, we will do 50 minutes of presentation and 10 minutes of uh, question and answers. Um, during the, uh, the presentation, feel free to um, post your questions on the Q&A uh, app at the bottom of your screen. Um, we will uh, then collect all these questions and address them one by one uh, at the end of this uh, session. This session is uh, recorded and also um, it's uh, streamed uh, on Facebook. Um, so you will be able to review and watch it again uh, at a later stage. Um, it will be uh, also posted on the uh, Regident website um, afterwards. So this is all about the uh, uh, intro. Um, so today I have the big pleasure, I said, to uh, welcome uh, Andrea Piloni. Um, Andrea, do you uh, hear me? For uh, I'm sure that most of you know uh, Professor Piloni. Professor Piloni received uh, his MD and DDS degree at the University of uh, Roma. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Um, and a master uh, MSc in oral biology and a postgraduate certificate of preceptor hip in periodontics at the University of California in uh, Los Angeles, US. While at uh, UCLA, he's been assistant researcher in the dental anatomy and oral biology department chaired by Professor Burnett. At present uh, time, he's professor and chair of periodontology in the section of periodontics at the University of Roma Sapienza, School of Dentistry and professor of periodontology at the School of Dental Hygiene at the same university director of the postdoc master program in periodontics. In 2017, received the position by national habilitation as full professor, adjunct associate part-time faculty at the Ohio State University section periodontics, member of the Italian Ministry of Health in the Committee for National Board of Italian and Non-European Dentists, active member of the Italian Society of Periodontology, member of the scientific committee, and international member of the American Academy of Periodontology. Scientific chairman of the Committee for Continuing Education of the CIC, meaning coordination of all Italian dental society. He is also member of the European Tissue Repair Society and the European Wound Management Association active member of the Wound Healing Society, past president and founder of the Italian Association of Bad Breath, author of many scientific and clinical articles in peer-reviewed journals, and one book on GTR, private practice uh, limited to periodontics. For us as Regident, Andrea Piloni is someone extremely valuable with a huge uh, experience with hyaluronic acid, uh, as well clinical as scientific. So we are very pleased to leave you the stage, if uh, I may say. Thank you, Alexander. And uh, dear colleagues and uh, friends, uh, welcome, buonasera. Uh, let me say thanks to Regident for this wonderful um, opportunity to uh, share together with you not only biological and clinical uh, insights into a hyaluronic acid and periodontal treatment, but uh, let me say most of all my personal experience and then you'll see that this molecule that is very, uh, seems to be very useful has been part of my professional life ever since. So a big, uh, uh, I have to go ahead. 
but I don't know how to go to move on. Okay. Um, a big hug from the city of Rome. And uh, of course, uh, this is a difficult time for everyone, but I'm very optimistic and uh, I hope that uh, all of you can come and give again back to Rome a big hug from your side. So why hyaluronic acid that from now on we will uh, uh, name with the just two letters of HA, just to be uh, quicker. Um, when I uh, decided to move to United States and start um, my uh, research plan, I was mostly uh, interested in uh, uh, the wound dealing in general of periodontal tissues, not only the soft ones like you see here, but also all the other ones like cementum bone and PDL. But I was kind of fascinated by looking at the quality of the healing that we can see on a clinical basis, uh, scar-free in some areas and very little scar formation in some others, the timing and so forth. And you know that this is very, um, very much evident in the clinical situation when we manage the soft tissues for periodontal or implant purposes. So we see that uh, there is some fascinating environment into this when we play with tissues and they heal fast and with top quality. And but we will see how this is important in clinical uh, application. I started in 1989 moving at UCLA, but back then, right a year before, I was reading a paper by Berkowitz and Newman that were talking about PDL, periodontal ligament, as a fetal-like tissue. And I said, how can the periodontal ligament be resembled to fetal tissues? So something there was telling me uh, what is the implication of the molecules around regeneration and repair. So they were saying that uh, PDL is a fetal-like tissue, just like another one, only one in the adult life that is a vitreous humor vitreous of the, of the eye. It's like an environment very rich of hyaluronic acid. So just like the fetal tissues, those only two adult ones, seem to be very close to the embryo and the fetus in characteristics of biological uh, molecular biology and cells. And let me show you just one paper that was published in 2012 saying that uh, the fetus is like a sponge of HA with cells, of course, that seems not to create in case of wounds any type of uh, scarring into the first two trimesters of pregnancy. So this uh, risk of uh, creating scars starts only from the third um, um, trimester of pregnancy and on in the adult life. So something there with HA must tell us that we could uh, utilize this information, okay? And so to the left, you see, you see my driver's license there down there, my mentor, Professor Carranza, who was the chairman at that time at UCLA. And in 1992, I uh, graduated with my uh, first data on osteogenesis and HA. Well, at UCLA. His research was with Dr. George Bernard on the role of hyaluronic acid in bone formation in vitro. The results were quite significant and implied that hyaluronic acid may be an important therapeutic agent in the future, especially in periodontal treatment. Uh, Dr. Piloni's future plans are to return to Italy and practice, teach, and continue research in periodontics. And of course, you can tell that the difference between my face now and then is not, not much. So my experience with HA was something like this. I first looked at the osteogenesis and we published that uh, uh, HA has a role in creating calcification of the bone, bony cells when they're close into, uh, uh, ready to uh, get into confluence and form 
um, an osteogenic area. So 1998, the first publication on bone regeneration and bone growth. 1998, we look at the bacteriostatic effect of IHA. Before then, the, the, the most of papers were looking at hyaluronic acid, something that would also almost uh, create a good environment for, for bugs to grow. We were the first one saying that it has a bacteriostatic effect that can be postponed, po uh, um, um, put into the uh, application of the same into the uh, periodontal environment. 2003, we looked at the effect of HA at the calcification of periodontal ligament in cell culture. So little by little, we were moving into from uh, as a tra uh, translational movement from the laboratory to the clinical practice. And this is why 2011, a first randomized controlled clinical pilot study looking at the efficacy of HA in periodontal clinical parameters. Now, very close to now, 2018, thanks to a big group of people, thanks to us and to them, uh, the University of Bern, the University of Zurich, we looked at the Miller class one single uh, gingival recession sites in a randomized, randomized controlled clinical trial type of study to see the application of HA in mucogingival and the mucogingival uh, application. And now, very recently, we uh, submit a paper, and thanks again to uh, the group of in Sapienza and Tony Skulian and others, uh, looking at 24 months healing of intrabony defects. So looking at the regenerative surgery. Let me now immediately, but very briefly tell you what happened in almost a century. In 1934, for, uh, uh, two scientists looked at the uh, bovine vitreous humor and they found this substance that, down, that then was the hyaluronic acid, uh, also found in the umbilical cord, in the rooster comb, different sources. But this uh, molecule was in many, many tissues back then and from then to now thousands of papers have been published. Very briefly, a huge volume, but very, very light, very, very light. One gram of HA absorbs three liters of, uh, of water. So it seems to be there into tissues that require fluids, not only water, but fluids and cells to move like a big empty sponge uh, that enables tissues to grow. I mean, at that time when I arrived at UCLA, already HA was into morphogenesis, in tissue repair, in fracture sites, osteogenesis, calcification, and last but not least, fetal surgery, as we talked about before. So hyaluronic acid is into four crucial steps of tissue repair and regeneration, mostly regeneration. Uh, the blood clot, inflammation, proliferation and remodeling. And we'll see that these four um, issues of uh, tissue regeneration and repair are very crucial, especially in, in our hands when we play with, with periodontal tissues uh, in terms of mucogingival surgery and regeneration. This is basically the topic that we're covering today to give you uh, an opportunity to look at a different molecule but it's different that it, it's around us, almost has been here and around us for a century. So uh, clinical cases of, of severe periodontal disease, meaning that we have uh, uh, to deal most of the times with infrabony lesions that are prone to be selected with our methods and with our, with our hands for regenerative purposes. I put the initials of each single case that you see here of the names of the, are my patients because they are the only one case that looks like that. Remember, this is very important. And the same is for mucogingival re, uh, lesions, for gingival recessions. My uh, dear friend, uh, uh, Oni Skulian, a very famous professor at the University of Bern, we, we're working together with this and, and his group with, with mine 
trying to, to look at also how the mucogingival deformities or a lack of, of soft tissue around teeth can be um, implemented in our methods, surgical methods with HA. So on one side, the infra bony lesion, that can be in aesthetic areas. On the other side, the mucogingival surgery, where the patient is here to ask, him, uh, to ask us for root coverage, uh, coverages procedures to give aesthetics. Uh, and it's not only a matter of methods and how effective they are, it's also uh, um, an issue that is related to the long-term data, to the effectiveness in the long run, and not only for uh, um, two, three, four years to see how our pictures look nice, but also to say, uh, to tell our patients that what we select for them, including HA, is in the long run. So let's put our um, interest into, for example, uh, periodontal tissue regeneration with relative, relevant clinical outcomes. And we all know that by looking at outcomes, we want to see the before and after. We would like to see uh, an infrabony lesion on the radiographical standpoint that is solved with the radio opacity and the infrabony component that, it, that is uh, filled with, uh, with tissue. And we are successful by uh, getting uh, PAL gain, uh, PPD reduction, uh, monitoring the level of recession, and maintenance of results over time. These are the relevant, relevant clinical outcomes. But into these clinical outcomes, we have to uh, concentrate into the biological uh, aspects that take to our final results. And by understanding what happens there, we can be more, um, we, are, we are safer in, in, in choosing and selecting uh, biomolecules because we know what they can do in the short period of time, the first phase, phases of healing, uh, uh, and then uh, uh, taking to the predictable long run. Two issues that are very important are cell migration and clot stabilization. Cell migration, meaning cells that need to move from one area to another one, and clot stabilization, because we all know how central is the role of the clot that has to be stable within the area. So again, uh, we can uh, uh, put this information for mucogingival surgery, and it's again uh, the, the need of looking at cells that migrate with stabilization of the clot. So let's talk about now these two uh, different uh, areas of periodontal surgeries, but that basically in common have the wound healing concept of periodontal surgery that we see on a daily basis in our hands. And sometimes we, we know that uh, um, uh, the clinical results are in, in front of our eyes in the immediate run, in the uh, short period of time, and we meet and immediately understand when something is going well or wrong during other processes of uh, uh, methods of, uh, of surgical access. So the beginning normally is an incision. And we know that uh, when we put our first incisions, we have to uh, consider that uh, um, tissues should start uh, from, from, from scratch, should be uh, um, healthy. Uh, the, the, uh, the healthier they, they are, the easier it is for them to, to, to heal. So this is important mostly in mucogingival surgery and should be uh, similar to the approach of uh, regeneration, periodontal regeneration. Because we, let's face it, we wait very, very little before seeing some sort of nice healing. I mean, uh, very few days, three, four, five, up to seven days, one week can uh, show us, can tell us how fast and nice 
is the quality of periodontal healing. So there's something there that puts together two very different compartments, which is the epithelial tissue, the connective tissue, and those two compartments have to intermingle with them and communicate. By communicating, they are prone to heal uh, well. And let me show you what happens in the clinical practice. We put a, a place an incision and we see in only 24 hours some closure. And I have friends <laughs> around the world. One of them is uh, Professor Stevens, um, Phil Stevens from the University of Cardiff, that he can, that can show us how cells tend to um, get together once we play an incision and he can show us how um, um, this communication by uh, biomolecules and extracellular matrix compartments uh, are effective or not. And uh, to, to be very practical, from the surface, from the epithelial layer to the connective tissue, see there is a, a communication between epithelial cells, the keratinocytes, and connective tissue cells, like the fibroblasts or myofibroblasts. And seeing green to the right side of the screen, you see, you can read ECM. ECM means extracellular matrix. So cell communicate one to another. Uh, they, they can uh, uh, communicate information and how to, to lead to uh, the healing. Uh, uh, through an extra cellular matrix, very specific uh, um, uh, situation. And so cells communicate, myofibroblasts with epithelial cells. We've done a study on humans with biopsies only at 24 hours to see how these uh, cells uh, tend to help the healing of soft tissue. So communication between cells and extracellular matrix. So we know there must be something in between cells that enables them to then uh, get into confluence and start forming a new tissue. So let's be immediately practical. How can we uh, conceive a root coverage techniques or mucogingival surgery plus hyaluronic acid? Well, we know that by... Uh, uh, applying this uh, molecule, we are into, as I said, blood clot, uh, monitoring the inflammation, cell proliferation, and remodeling. And we'll see... that what we do clinically should match the biology. Some time ago, in 2006, my, myself and Professor Paolo Antonio, the chairman of the University of Chieti, and Paolo Camargo, is the chairman at UCLA now, uh, wanted to look at uh, um, uh, biomolecules to help the mucogingival surgery and the healing. And the same thing we've done, as I showed you before, in 2018, uh, looking at the effectiveness of HA uh, by uh, using the coronally advanced flap and cover the root uh, when it's exposed. So uh, we, in this study, divided the patient in two areas. We took test side, the control side. We looked at uh, ginger recession, class one Miller, Miller class one. We located the gingival margin. We located the depth of the sulcus. We located the mucogingival line. So even in case with very little uh, presence of attached gingiva, uh, we select these cases for a coronally advanced flap, uh, putting underneath the flap, as you can see now, uh, a, a very um, efficacious uh, molecule that should play with cells and clot and speed up the healing. So we raise the flap, as you know, which is um, a full and a split thickness. So we can uh, passively move upwards, in this case, or downwards for upper jaw recessions. Uh, and uh, 
um, and close the area. So once we, uh, we apply the biomodulator HA uh, in a few seconds, let's say in a couple of minutes, we immediately see that the, the clot is stable and forms and creates a sort of meshwork, uh, a mesh that is st stays there stable, ready to play with cells. We're convinced of that. So if the flap is coronally advanced with no tension, without tension, is a passive uh, flap, in a few uh, days, and of course the picture you see here of the uh, outcome of the result is a 12 months result, and picture taken, of course, for the study up to 24 months uh, analysis. We, uh, we also looked at the uh, visual as a visual analog scale re patient response to say that it's not only um, feasible for the clinical practice, but also with very, very little post-op discomfort. So this is something that we want to take into consideration, uh, not only to say uh, and to see how uh, the uh, healing is fast and nice, but also from the patient perspective, um, the, uh, the good use of that. This is a one-year follow-up. And uh, uh, of course, we're talking about the coronally advanced flap when there is still some attached gingiva left uh, 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 to uh, consider this um, Miller class recession as one, okay? So we raise the flap. This is the exposure of the root. This is the application of the uh, of a layer of gel of HA in, in uh, form of gel. This is one meter later, one minute later. This is uh, now you see two minutes later and the blood seems to to crawl over and underneath and within this gel. We ad, uh, advance the uh, flap. And uh, of course we have, we had uh, a nice healing and, but mostly the patient uh, post-op uh, very little discomfort. We have looked this also into the um, multiple recession areas. Uh, this is another case the application of HA over the root surface. And I'll talk uh, to you very soon about the difference with other biomolecules. The, um, the two minutes later, we wait for about two minutes, then we close passive uh, and not without tension flap. Uh, this is the healing at 24 hours. See, there is no redness. Uh, there is no uh, tension of the flap and it looks very nice at only one day after the surgery. And this is the evaluation at 18 months, uh, the before and after. Uh, and also we are uh, running a study uh, looking at the um, effectiveness of HA when there is the need of a connective tissue graft in class Miller class two. So there is the need to uh, to put a, a graft, a connective tissue graft taken from the palate uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, HA and a flap without tension. This is the healing at 12 months. So let's now move into the other area of periodontal surgery. And um, let's see if there is some, some, some benefit in the infrabony uh, defect treatment. Okay, so we're talking about now of periodontitis with lesions that are deep that require not only an access flap to remove the, the granulation tissue, but mostly uh, tend to regeneration, to regenerate uh, what periodontitis as a, a severe, uh, in the severe form uh, creates not only infrabony lesions, but uh, real loss of attachment, loss of support. And this is more so uh, important uh, when it's about uh, aesthetic areas. So periodontal regeneration is effective. We know how many studies have been carried out to, to tell our patients that this is something we should select for them, especially because we have patients that, that sometimes don't even 
uh, understand what's going on in terms of uh, loss of support around the teeth. Look at patient number uh, one, look at patient number two, and the only difference seems to be one probing that measure buckle of number 1.3, deep lesion. Yes, the patient doesn't even understand and, uh, that her aesthetic is impaired by this loss of attachment that we can visualize uh, before the surgery and more so when the flap is open. So this is uh, one centimeter of uh, uh, loss of attachment. So we're there trying to see not only the closure the, of the pocket, but also new cementum, new PDL, and new bone. This is the infrabony defect. We have to recreate lost uh, new support that is lost due to the disease. So it's not only thinking of some bone cells that should crawl over the root surface and, and attach and create only bone. We need more than that. We are looking for a, re a new attachment, the PDL, new cementum, and bone. And no matter how uh, confident we are in using uh, our methods, we have to visualize the morphology of the defect. It's just one, if it's one, two, three wall defect, if, it's a, if there is a, an angle that we, we desire to see, if we want to select a graft, a specific graft material alone or implemented by stabilization of the clot or implemented for cell uh, regeneration, cell movement and clot stability to then get into the uh, nice outcome that we are uh, looking for. So it's a matter of not only seeing a regenerated area, but uh, the um, materials we use next to the stabilization of the clot. So clot and hyaluronic acid, we've seen that before. But let me show you just a, a few of the hundreds of papers related to HA and uh, clot formation. This is 1995, a very important journal uh, that observed uh, the inhibition of clot lysis, but also a stimulation of clot formation by hyaluronic acid. Uh, many, many years ago, uh, research started to, to prove the increase ten, the tensile strength of tensile strength of granulation tissue by the application of ironic acid. Significant power to the increase of tensile strength. Science, 1985, the angiogenesis is induced by the degradation products of HA. So angiogenetic power into the area. And that's made uh, science. This is matrix, uh, hyaluronic acid, interactions with hydroxyapatite do not uh, interfere with the hydroxyapatite crystal proliferation and growth. So if we are into osteogenesis, we need HA. Last but not least is a vehicle for peptide growth factors, many of them. So if we are into uh, periodontal regeneration and the graphs or combined methods, mostly uh, the combined one that seem to have given uh, better data in the past 30, 30 years of research and science uh, regarding periodontal regeneration. So when we combine the graft plus a biomolecule, we're into their uh, area. But let me show you what sometimes we, we have to face with. Uh, we have to apply our molecules in absence of um, blood. Um, sometimes we see that the presence of human blood interacts neg negatively with some biomolecules. So what happens if we apply HA, a graft into um, a specific infrabony lesion uh, and, uh, and what can be uh, the expectations we have uh, by the combination of HA and the graft. Well, let me tell you one thing. First of all, HA 
can be with, um, applied with blood, in presence of blood, because we know that the role of HA is uh, strongly um, uh, related to the importance of the presence of the clot and clot stabilization, clot stability. This is a very deep infrabony lesion, very wide in a very young patient. He's, he wasn't even 30 years uh, old when we uh, treated this case many, many years ago. So we raised the flap in a sandwich fashion. So the HA gel over the root surface after the granulation of the area, uh, degranulation of the area, uh, sandwich, sandwich technique, so the graft, and again, HA, uh, uh, coronally advancing the flap in a passive uh, way. This is a, one of the first cases we treated here in Rome. Seven years of follow-up, made more now, uh, to, uh, that shows you still some remnant of, remnants of the graft, but the, uh, the uh, space uh, um, that tells us that some PDL has been uh, created and, of course, alveolar bone uh, regenerated. Uh, let me go back and the pro a little bit of recession, but uh, very nice case, I must say. Um, this case uh, shows you, I want to present you this uh, series of pictures with another uh, sandwich uh, technique in a posterior area where you can see that only uh, uh, already at 72 hours time, the healing is really um, uh, nice with no uh, infl uh, inf inf inflammation of, of uh, marginal tissues and from baseline to six years a nice um, growth gain of attachment. This is another case just to tell you that sometimes we're, we're lucky also for uh, super bony defects but let me tell you how difficult it is to treat super bony defects again in the, in the combined method. This is uh, another case uh, and this is a case that shows you that uh, even when you, you lose some tissue, but the regeneration uh, occurs underneath, little by little, uh, six months, 12 months, and 18 months later, you see um, coronal growth of tissue between uh, the elements, uh, the uh, covering on, of the roots, and the gain of attachment. This is another seven years uh, post-op uh, case. Very quickly, uh, I have 10 minutes, right, Alexander? Uh, difficult areas, aesthetic areas, where you have, uh, for example, a 1.4 uh, upper right first premolar, with a difficult area being not only um, an infrabony lesion, the shrinkage of the papilla, but also, you know, the furcation involvement of that specific area of the first premolar. So the patient wants to save the tooth, but wants to have regeneration and would like to uh, get a better appearance of that papilla. So what we do, we raise the flap, we split the flap, uh, and then we are into the infrabony lesion. I like to use the, um, uh, the blade to cut around and inside the area to remove the granulation tissue. Uh, this is a single, single flap approach. And once this is done, uh, I uh, try to uh, minimize the, um, the action with the uh, ultrasonic devices or my instruments to visualize the defect. Let me move a little bit fat, quicker. Um, so once the area is ready for the um, application of our uh, grafts or uh, biomolecules, we now are there visualizing our defect, infrabony defect with uh, at least two remnant walls. We keep cleaning the area, and once the measurements are, are ready, we sometimes use some EDTA, we rinse with saline solution thoroughly, we dry the area, and then uh, 
we decapitalize a little bit the margins and we are ready to uh, apply um, the uh, HA, hyaluronic acid. Uh, we now need uh, clot stabilization. We need this molecule to immediately interact with the fluid, with cells. Uh, and of course, we implement the uh, area with the graft. Okay, so very quickly we put the graft and uh, um, fill nicely the defect. So this is uh, before the application of the com combination of graft and HA. This first upper uh, left slide is at 24 hours. The one to the right is uh, uh, one week and there's um, uh, one magnification of the same picture upper right. So see the papilla is in position 24 hours to the left, seven days. Uh, this is the first six months where the graft is still in place. This is 18 months, so before two years, where uh, we can start, of course, considering that uh, the st uh, stability of the graft uh, uh, is maintained. This is 12 months. We start probing uh, not before 12 months, but at 12 months we see the uh, enormous reduction of probing depth, a little bit of covering of the exposed uh, root of uh, the first premolar, papilla uh, still maturating with between the two teeth. This is at 18 months, uh, patient is very, very much compliant. And this is at five years. And uh, let me show you what happened here. We had the uh, almost complete coverage uh, of the root, we have almost complete, I mean, most of the uh, embrasure uh, is uh, filled with soft tissue. We have the growth and gain of radiological gain of uh, attachment. And now let me show you uh, the, um, the clinical appearance now of uh, my patient and a little video that was uh, played with uh, a cell phone by my hygienist now to, to show uh, us that uh, what we've done is very, very effective. Um, but of course, this can be done for much deeper defects. This is a case I want to show you because a very, very deep lesion of a first premolar, uh, uh, sorry, mesial of a canine. This is the uh, defect once is uh, once is uh, freed from granulation tissue, and this is the application of HA. And I want to show you how immediate is the uh, formation of this. Uh, mesh, uh, mesh work of, uh, of uh, um, and clot stabilization. This is the mixture with the graft. Now see how the clot gets stable and becomes a net. You can almost visualize this net of clot. Then we apply our uh, graft. We, um, we apply the graft in order to fill the, the area. Before and after one year re-entry, that was done because of uh, the need of uh, covering the root. Okay, so I get uh, the chance to visualize what happened at one year. At one year. Um, to move to the end of my presentation, some of us have also tried to use HA alone. Uh, this is one case of five years from baseline that we presented at Europe Aereo in uh, Amsterdam uh, a couple of years ago. Another case that belongs to the study that we're publishing with uh, uh, Tony Skoulian at four years. And uh, a final uh, uh, 
study that was published in January 2019 uh, looking at cemental tear associated bony defects uh, like this case report where a two-year follow-up we we could see the use of uh, HA in a resorbable collagen membrane without a graft material and the complete regeneration of that area that was missing around that element. Uh, well, the defect is not a disease, it's a, a cemental tear, but very efficacious, the treatment. So to conclude, <clears throat> uh, two minutes. Uh, we're not talking about grafting. We're, not ta we're talking about grafting and implementing uh, a bone defect where with something that enables cells to migrate, to differentiate into the area where, where they're needed. And you can see from the study by Bartold in 2000, where he was uh, a uh, focusing on this issue that is very, very crucial for uh, periodontal regeneration. We need progenitor cells that come from vascular channels to then they had to migrate, differentiate, and also play with the clot. This is something that happens, that should happen um, in nature, uh, because uh, you know the PDL is rich of hyaluronic acid. And this is what we like to uh, biomimic when it comes to uh, select our regenerative method, methods. Uh, this is what we should see. Uh, we should think of uh, um, uh, happening uh, while we um, use our uh, regenerative methods. We are helping cells. They're, they're moving from an area to another one much quickly, much quicker, and with the help of blood. So it's a matter of cell migration, but mostly cell-to-cell -cell communication. And we're sure that in the future, this can be um, something uh, important, not only for uh, periodontal treatment, for periodontal regeneration, for mucogingival surgery, but also for uh, soft tissue management around implants. Uh, I want to conclude by showing you uh, our university. We are in the center of Rome and Sapienza was founded in 1303. And if you need some uh, more specific uh, suggestions from us or from Regident, just type also to our email address. Grazie. Alexander actually speaks very good Italian so he can interact with you in several languages, French, uh, German, uh, Deutsch, whatever it is, English and Italian, right? <laughs> I'll, Grazie. Do, I'll do my best. Grazie mille, professore. It was very, very interesting, uh, a very interesting presentation combining um, science and clinical application. Thank you so much. Um, we can now start the uh, sessions with uh, the questions. Um, I see already a few in the Q&A app at the bottom of your screen. We can maybe start with the uh, first question from uh, uh, Paolo. Um, his question is, do you think the use of AHA in root coverage reduces the need to withdraw a CTG in periodontal thin phenotypes? Well, this is a, um, a question that I would like to answer. Uh, very soon because uh, so far we have no evidence of um, the um, uh, use of HA that might increase the thickness of tissue. So in that case we still have for thin phenotypes um, have to rely upon some grafting from somewhere, mostly from the palate. We know that, especially, I mean, it is from the palate. But what happens with the use of HA and connective tissue grafts when they are needed, especially when there is lack of attached gingiva, uh, and this is uh, uh, mostly from our friend Tony Skulian, and he's done an incredible mucogingival surgeries and connective tissue graft plus uh, HA. 
because for only coronally advanced flaps, as, as we proved in our 2018 paper, uh, we need to get to, to at least start from a little bit of attached gingiva. Then uh, we, we see nice uh, results in a very few hours after the surgery with HA. But in, in, uh, if it's a matter of increasing the thickness of, of the tissue, I, I don't know now. Uh, probably not, but uh, we'll see. Thank you. Um, another question from Sylvia. Um, I think she's referring to the uh, infrabony defect you treated. She's wondering if you're never using a membrane. Well, uh, it's hard to say we never use membranes because, of course, now with combined techniques, we we are, are more confident to see our, our, uh, our materials more stable, okay? But of course, when the angle is wider, when the, uh, the defect is big, <clears throat> bigger than, you know, normal within 30 degrees uh, of angles, uh, sometimes the membrane can be uh, a good means for further stabilizing our materials. You know, when the graft has to be selected, we put it there, but we want the graft to be stable along with the clot. And what happens with the use of the membrane? If the uh, defect mor morphology does not allow the stability of clot and graft, why not a membrane, okay? So it depends on the morphology of the defect, right, Alexander, do you agree with me? <laughs> You're an expert. <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are two experts here. <laughs> Another question from Sylvia um, is what's about the mobility of the tooth? So when you're injecting HA, how do you handle the mobility? Well, I don't know if uh, the colleague knows my philosophy. Well, I'm very much into this idea that when you start playing with the regeneration, First thing to make sure of is the stability of the element of the tooth. So let's say that the, the tooth is a little bit mm, unstable, plus or one. Well, I'd like to start with zero mobility because, and it's my opinion, okay? It's not uh, supported by strong evidence, but it's like what happens with, with implants. When you put an implant and you want to see a, a fast osteo integration, a predictable osteo integration. Of course, you want to see the implant stable. And the same is for a membrane. You put a membrane, you stabilize the membrane. You use screws, you, you use sutures. So when it comes to stability of the root, I want to start from scratch from a stable element. So it can be stable from scratch or, uh, or stabilized by splinting. It doesn't matter as long as cells migrate and attach over the root surface with a stable root. Thank you. Um, question about repeating how you do the flap, whether you do partial and then full or vice versa. Well, this is another uh, answer I want to, to give to the colleague this way. Well, by, by moving a flap upward uh, or downward and make it passive without tension. It's just a matter of releasing those uh, fibers or, or maybe some muscles that might tend to not make this flap become passive. So uh, in my hands, I 99% I of the times tend to, to cut those uh, uh, tension fibers underneath the flap to make it uh, passive. Um, and this is more so when we, ha we have uh, deep recessions because we have to move a, a lot of tissue over the, 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 the exposed root and as my uh, friend and, and big professor Giampaolo Pini Prato has published years ago, he tends to go over the cementum enamel junction of a few millimeters. And of course, Giovanni Zucchelli is our uh, king into these considerations. But um, 
it's a matter of how uh, mobile this flap becomes. If it's not, if it does not, we do that. Thank you. Question, do you find this kind of treatment contraindicated if there is a poor post-operative post -operative home care? Mm, not really. Uh, I, I mean, hyaluronic acid, listen, has been around for uh, almost a century. And the, the, the thing that's fascinating me, not only because it's applicable for so many uh, medical applications, is that the uh, side effects in general are considered none, are considered zero. Right, Alexander? I mean, if we look at the aesthetic medicine, we look at the general medicine, we look at plastic surgery, we look into periodontal surgery. Uh, I mean, the, the literature says uh, so many different things, but the one thing that uh, really striking, the most striking one is that uh, nobody talks about side effects. So the contraindication for uh, tissues or, or patients, specific patients, including their compliance, I don't, I don't see any problem with that. Fully agree. Yeah, of course. I mean, it's a, really, it's a, almost, a, what, 90 years of, of research. <clears throat> it's, it's for sure the most studied biomolecules ever. Um, one question from Christina. Uh, HA stimulates cell migration in the first phase of wound healing. What kind of cell does HA promote? And if it is non-discriminatory, does that mean that we could have inflammatory cell proliferating in the first phase? Well, this is, uh, Christina is asking, uh, raising a very important issue because there is a lot into uh, inflammation control by these biomolecules, mostly because by um, creating uh, a good environment for cells to move, uh, it's like uh, trafficking. <laughs> when there is traffic, there is a little not good movement. So what uh, uh, HA immediately does, and this is seen, uh, of course, in the first uh, phases of, uh, of tissue growth from the embryo and fetus and so forth, uh, it, it looks like it creates a, a proper 3D environment for cells to move. And of course, when it comes to adult tissues, we're talking about mesenchymal cells to become connective tissue, cell line cells, like bone, cementum, and PDL. But it's a matter of creating the, great, the, the, the proper 3D environment for cells to move, to differentiate, because if you know if cells get next to each other, they get in contact, the differentiation stops, okay? So for cells to differentiate and to move, they, have, they, need, they need to be separated in, in the uh, proper 3D environment. So it's a great question, but when it comes to the inflammatory uh, uh, part is, is, is even more tricky, but HA is, has a lot to do with that. A lot to do with that. So there is a subsequent, subsequent sorry, there is another uh, question about the uh, inflammatory process, which I think you answered partly, uh, is to know if there is a, a, a defined and known process uh, having an, an anti-inflammatory effect. I, I wouldn't say that, no. Uh, not because uh, it, uh, we had, uh, especially in the uh, late 90s, um, several studies that tried to to look at that, but to say there is a, a, no, a not pro-inflammatory effect that we we have not not we're not sure for that. But uh, there's a lot to 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 talk about, especially because infl inflammation is not only negative. Inflammation is, a, is can be a very very important positive effect, and in that way, inflammatory cells move. Uh, normally to then, you know, start the pro-inflammatory reactions. You know what I mean? It's, uh, 
it creates a good environment. I mean, it's like now, we need a much better environment to, to keep going. Okay. Um, we have still a few more questions. Um, do you have any experience by using it uh, to infiltrate into Papilla? Of course, of course I do. Well, uh, let me um, answer very quickly. This is an interesting question. Um, my very close friend, uh, Dimitri Tatakis, Professor Tatakis, the director of the postgraduate program at Ohio State University, where I have my uh, faculty position. He was the first one, along with Bill Becker in uh, Arizona, um, in Texas, sorry, in Texas, Houston, uh, that have tried the infiltration of the papilla to uh, close the embrasures with uh, actually hyodent. And uh, they published two different papers and they have shown uh, very good results. Now, from, from that to say that uh, it works uh, all the time to all kinds of papillas, to all kinds of embrasures and to all kinds of uh, different uh, phenotypes, we have no idea yet. But I'm sure that um, that in the near future, Alexander and I will see something related to the infiltration of the papilla. But let me close immediately the story of the papilla. Papilla, it's not easy to increase in size because it's something very solid. It's not like an empty space that, like the upper and lower lips. But uh, those, those papers were not bad. I mean, very interesting. I and mean, especially from two gi uh, giants of periodontology. We'll see. To be continued. Um, okay, the last three questions. Uh, one related Before to dinner. Yeah, exactly. In Switzerland, we, we eat early. Um, you wanna, would you like to have Italian dinner now or the Swiss, the Swiss uh, dinner? I go, face it. I go for both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why do you have to wait two minutes? Uh, is this time enough to create a cellular proliferation over the root? Listen, there's no science into those two minutes. And one of my best friends, Roberto Rossi from Genoa, a uh, talented uh, periodontist, says uh, that that is the time that we make like a, it's a phone, phone call technique. We, you, you wait a little bit in order to have the slot stable and you keep going. Two minutes, one minute or three minutes, not science there, but just Take a look at what happens when you apply this uh, gel uh, into the area and, and it seems to play immediately with clot and little by little this clot becomes something different, something more stable. Like, uh, and you, you, you could visualize this net that tends to almost make us see that cells can move over uh, this net. And it's interesting, it's not two or three minutes, good question. There's no science there. I just want to show you and tell you, take a picture and, or wait to look at with your eyes what happens after two or three minutes. Thank you. Um, what about the importance of the conservative rehabilitation in order to restore the lost interproximal contact points? As in the case of the canine premolar with infrabony defect treated in the presentation, do you think it's better before or after surgery? Many questions. Well, uh, my, my personal uh, understanding after so many years of uh, periodontal regeneration, I mean, more than 30 years, I, try, I, I like to, to keep space for tissue that are growing, tissues that are growing. So it's a good question because uh, we also know how important is the restoration that guides somehow soft tissue growth. But um, during the very, very first few months, I will keep the, the space free uh, to have this tissue grow and then modulate this growth uh, conditioning the growth of the soft tissue, especially in embrasures, embrasure areas uh, with the restoration. So first part of the healing, let it go alone and then condition with the restoration. This is a very important question. Thank you for, for asking. 
studies have shown that stem cells live for about 20 minutes when, it con when it's in contact with collagen, its viability increases. Are there any studies where contact of HA with a blood clot helps stem cells live longer and better? Well, uh, let me answer um, saying that uh, I just know there are so many studies on stem cells and HA. The only part I know uh, from the uh, effectiveness regarding the effectiveness of, of HA is to, on cells that are already differentiated towards the mesenchymal ones. So I've, I'm not an expert on stem cells and HA, but let me tell you, there are hundreds of papers on that. So it's not uh, my, um, my field, but uh, I'm sure that there are many studies, especially in looking at the early stages of, uh, of organism growth, you know. We deal with uh, cells that are already differentiated from stem, stem to, you know, the cell lineage of the connective tissue or epithelial cells. Sorry for not answering, <laughs> but I'm sure there are so many papers on that. Okay, uh, I mean, we have uh, uh, questions keep on, on coming in. Uh, do you still have time for one or two? Okay. Okay. If, so if I can answer to them, yes, of course. If not, uh, you answer, Alexander, okay? My God, they will love it. Help me. <laughs> so do you use AHA in the non surgical therapy uh, SRP? <laughs> yes. Uh, Okay, uh, um, yes, there have been several studies uh, published on the use uh, on the non surgical use of HA. One is ready to be published by us, right? Alexander is going to be a multi center study. Uh, five centers in Europe that are going to be involved. Again, thanks also to my friend Tony Skulian. Um, we, we have no, we, we see some difference because, uh, uh, of course, the non surgical application has one point in favor, which is the stability of the area. So, when you apply something into the pocket, but on the other hand, we know that the uh, gingival crevicular fluid changes 40 times a, an hour per hour. So uh, it's a matter of uh, how, how stable uh, HA can be in, in the pocket area. But uh, you'll see the data from this uh, study that it took us uh, almost four years to be prepared and, um, and carried out. But great, good question, we'll see. Thank you. And last question, uh, any indications in implantology? Well, uh, maybe Alexander can answer better for me. We know that uh, very um, uh, good colleagues, uh, talented colleagues like uh, Vincenzo Iore Siciliano uh, have looked at the uh, use of HA in treating, I think, perimplantitis. Uh, but it's, if it's, uh, the question is regarding um, the surgical application for implants, well, I, I think that you'll see uh, a lot of things in the future, especially for GBR application. Again, for uh, stabilizing the clot in the area where the big graft or uh, grafting methods are, are selected. Uh, soft tissue healing. Um, I think it's new for implants, but not new in terms of waiting 10 years, maybe one or two years and you'll see in on PubMed, uh, good, good stuff. Thank you so much, Andrea, for uh, taking the time of answering. Grazie. Uh, very much appreciated. I received already uh, many messages about uh, this session, a uh, very visual. Thank you for the opportunity, Alexander. Thank you very much. And let me say in thanking all these people that uh, um, gave me the opportunity to, to share uh, the state and my experience that uh, uh, all streets lead to Rome. Okay, so come to Rome soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, oh, good evening and stay safe.
Bye bye. Grazie, you too. Most of all. And don't forget this. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>